Hey guys, I hope you're all having a wonderful summer. And you know, summer is the best time of the year. You get summer break, lots of good movies come out at this time, and most importantly, it gets hot so you can tell climate change deniers how wrong they are, even though you could do that at any time of the year. There's absolutely nothing bad about summer, so we're going to celebrate by looking at a video that isn't too keen on the idea of anthropogenic global warming. But before we begin, I would like to give a shout out to some of my top patrons. Huge shout out to Fireshard and Elliot for being the current top supporters at $50, especially Fireshard who has donated the most amount in total. Then and to my $20 patrons, I would like to thank Anna, Trine Harold, Philip Costopoulos, Garrett R, and Aided Furball. You guys are such loyal supporters, and I very much appreciate everything you have done. And lastly, shout out to the rest of my patrons. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to continue what I'm doing now. YouTube, unfortunately, hasn't been very nice to my channel lately, so knowing I have loyal supporters gives me energy to continue making cringy videos like this one. Thank you. Now, without further ado, let's talk about how we're fucking up our planet, shall we? The thing is that the media constantly pushes the whole 97% narrative. Even though it's been debunked time and time again, they still keep pushing it, right? You heard Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, Barack Obama, all these different politicians, all these different media pundits, pundits constantly regurgitate this debunked talking point of 97% of climate scientists agree that global warming is happening and humans are causing it. No, they don't. You know, this 97% has been talked about a lot. I've seen a lot of people pull that out during debate all the time, but it seems that people on the opposite side are a lot more hung up on this number. I get it. Scientific consensus is everything. If you don't believe in anthropogenic global warming, then a scientific consensus against your position can be somewhat of a huge blow. Now, this channel here, Vincent James, has an entire video attempting to debunk the 97% claim. I won't be going over that now because there's another video that I do want to get to, but I'll put that in my catalog of future videos. But here's my short response to the 97% claim. It doesn't matter if the number is exactly 97%. What does matter, and is the truth, is that there is overwhelming scientific consensus, at least 95% or 90% if you're being generous. The claim has been confirmed by multiple other other studies that verified its accuracy. In other words, there is scientific consensus that there is scientific consensus. If you don't believe in John Cook's paper on the 97% claim, there are plenty of other papers out there that came to the same conclusion. And I find it so funny how this is probably the only topic where we would actually have to verify how many scientists believe in it. And that's because there's just a huge group of ignorant people who are trying to claim that scientists don't have a consensus on anthropogenic global warming. And it has bounced around in an echo chamber for so long that many people now believe it. It seems that no one is going to challenge the claim that whatever percentage of scientists believe in antibiotics, for example. But whatever. So in conclusion, there is a 90 to 100% consensus on global warming being primarily caused by human activity and that it will drastically change the dynamic of our Earth in the future. This statistic is based on people who are actually climate scientists, not just any field of science. Although even in the general field of science, denial is incredibly rare. There's consensus on this consensus, and that alone should be enough. This particular term, this mantra, came from a self-employed cartoonist named, what was his name, John, I can't remember his name, but it was a self-employed cartoonist who gathered together all these climate papers from these climate scientists and made a determination based on their papers. John Cook is a scientist, you know that, right? He's an Australian cognitive scientist. He's not a climate scientist, sure, but he was only measuring consensus, not any specific detail of climate change. Whether or not his research was done properly is irrelevant here, since numerous other scientists have confirmed this consensus. The number is actually closer to 100% because Cook ignored papers that didn't explicitly say they believe in anthropogenic global warming. These papers, however, are written under the assumption that people know that it is real, so they didn't mention it directly. It's an important step in scientific writing to not repeat well-known information. Even though a lot of these climate scientists like Richard Toll, Dr. Moon, Dr. Sorn, all these different climate scientists that I go through in this, there's hundreds of them that, that, that I go through in this video, say that, no, that's not what my paper said at all. Why are you misrepresenting my paper? John Cook, that was his name, self-employed cartoonist. I'll think about going through that video of his in another video. Depends on how many people want it. Uh, I had an astrophysicist on my channel as well that talked about a lot of the climate change narrative being based on uh, a lot of the climate uh, warm, the global warming narrative being based on false and, and, and falsified documents, falsified and, and completely incorrect math, by the way. He talks about it being based on, a, in, on the fake greenhouse effect, which isn't even the real greenhouse effect as we know it. Perfect, that's the video I want to respond to today, so let's have a look at this claim about fake greenhouse effects. Now for parts of the video, I'm going to let it run for a long time because it takes them a while to make their claim, so bear with me. My name is Joseph Postma, but a master's degree in astrophysics, which I got in 2009. But climate alarm, unfortunately, I do have to say that that is junk science. That is really, really bad science, and I can show quite easily or explicitly just how bad it is. What do you think of this diagram? This is how climate alarm is derived. This is that this diagram, this derivation in the mathematics in here is actually how climate alarmism is derived 
Uh, no, the idea of anthropogenic climate change wasn't derived from a single diagram. It's derived from understandings of multiple concepts, the greenhouse effect being one of them. And even the greenhouse effect has multiple aspects to it. For example, you could also look at the molecule closely and see how the specific bonds of carbon dioxide allows it to absorb infrared radiation. Your diagram there is a one-layer energy balance model. It's not a sole basis for our conclusion of man-made global warming, but rather is a simplified model for understanding the transmission of energy between the sun and the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, the basic idea is that you have the surface of the Earth, that's the bottom, right? And then you have the atmosphere. And so this S over 4 is the average amount of S standing for solar energy. So it's the solar energy divided by 4 coming through the atmosphere and then hitting the Earth. So it's all just the mathematical sort of equations uh, to describe average sunshine coming through the Earth. And then okay. what happens then internally between the ground surface and the atmosphere with that energy to subsequently cause what they claim is their idea of a greenhouse effect. This is the part where I do some simple explaining to the people who don't really understand what this diagram means, since you didn't do a great job describing it yourself. First of all, S doesn't stand for solar energy, it stands for irradiance, with the units of watts per square meter. It's divided by 4 because that averages out the amount of radiation received by the sun, since not all parts of the earth interacts with the sun at any given part of the day. Now since you didn't say what the rest of the diagram means, I'll give a brief explanation here. A stands for albedo, which is the fraction of radiation reflected back into space. Therefore, 1 minus a is the amount of this radiation that passes through. T in general stands for temperature. We have the atmospheric temperature and the surface temperature. Sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8 intensity over the fourth power of temperature. Last but not least, the one we are all interested in, epsilon represents emissivity. This is a percentage that represents how much infrared radiation is released. Now, this is the variable of interest because greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide directly affects it. The more CO2 in the atmosphere, the lower the emissivity value. I won't go over the exact math here, but essentially lower emissivity leads to higher temperatures. That's basically just what the greenhouse effect is. This model, of course, is a vast simplification of what actually happens in real life, but let's see how you're going to debunk it. What's the shape of the Earth? I would say, I mean, in my personal opinion, it's round, okay? No, I know, but no, in this diagram. Oh, it's flat. In this okay. diagram, it's flat, okay. Yeah, all right, so that's fine then, right? Isn't it? Well, these values all represent the global averages, right? So, so these the mathematics and physics here is referring to the entire system as a whole, right? So the entire system as a whole is coming in here with these numbers, with the S and S over four, and what's the surface of the Earth that is being used here? A flat. So do you think that when you extrapolate from, with mathematics that correspond to the Earth being flat, are you going to get the same math and physics as if the Earth was round? Like, look at this. This is the type of shit we have to deal with when it comes to climate change skeptics. You look at this diagram, which is obviously just a representation of the Earth's surface, and you think the math is based on a flat Earth model. It's not, it's just a visualization. Take this diagram of the water cycle, for example. Just because the ground is drawn flat, does that mean that this is based on a flat Earth model and is therefore wrong? Of course not. However, I know that this isn't what he's saying exactly. He mentioned that the diagram is flat, but what he really has a concern with specifically is the math used within it. He thinks the math is based entirely on flat earth physics. I did some research into this guy and it seems that he wrote an entire article explaining why the greenhouse effect is wrong. One of his reasons had to do with the S divided by 4 being the irradiance input. S on average is 1370 watts per square meter, which after divide by 4 turns out to be approximately 342 watts per square meter. He argues that the 342 value is wrong, which, to say the least, is a dumb criticism to make. I tracked down the webpage that they were going through and this is what was written in it. Since I cannot resist philosophical and logical paradoxes, I must ask you, what is the distance of climate alarmisms and modern physics flat earth away from the sun? The earth of the above four figures, what is the distance from the sun? We can calculate it from those diagram's numbers. They list the solar input as 342.5 watts per square meter. Since we know the effective temperature of the sun's photosphere, 5778 Kelvin, and we also know the sun's radius, 6.96 times 10 to the power of 8 meters, then we can calculate the distance distance d at which the sun's light produces a flux f of 342.5 watts per square meter given the inverse square law. The equation is as thus. Blah blah blah, plug and chug, he comes up with the number 298,272,585,139 meters. He concludes that this is two times the actual distance between the earth and the sun, and therefore the 342 watts per square meter that is used in the diagram is wrong. First of all, I don't see how this has anything to do with flat earth, you're just arguing the input radiation of the sun. Second of all, the 342 watts per square 
square meter was obtained after dividing the total irradiance by 4. This 4 is used because not all parts of the Earth are receiving sunlight at once. Night and day exist, you know. So if we take the sunlight and evenly distribute it throughout the Earth, then the divide by 4 factor is entirely correct. Therefore, if you wanted to calculate the distance of the Sun using irradiance, you should be using the actual total value of 1370 watts per square meter, not 342. So let's do that. I plugged and chugged it into the equation, and what do you know? You get approximately 1.49 times 10 to the 11th power. That's almost exactly what the distance is from the Earth to the Sun. Who would have thought? So the solar input is actually accurate. We divide by 4 when calculating the actual amount of radiation that enters Earth due to exactly the fact that the Earth is a globe and not all parts of the Earth receive sunlight at one particular moment in time. The sunlight has to then be redistributed to the rest of the Earth because everything else on the diagram is worked out for the entire Earth. That's just how this model works. So go to figure B just to sort of show sort of sort of a, a funnier figure. If you can put them beside each other, that would even let me help. See. Yeah, let me see. Figure, let me figure A B. and figure okay. B. Okay, so here's B. Here's figure B. Okay, so you got them so both up them together. Both beside each other, right? Okay, so this is actually what's happening. I mean, if you look at figure A, oh, well, that looks like complicated physics mm -hmm. and mathematics, and boy, that looks scary. And, you know, how are you ever going to engage with a scientist on that, right? You're not going to. But here, this is what it is on figure B. You actually cannot be serious with this. Answer this. How does your disagreement with solar radiation input have anything to do with what the model even says? The part of the model we are interested in is that increased greenhouse gases lead to a decrease in emissivity, which leads to higher temperatures. And why would a disagreement on solar input even have any relation to flat earth whatsoever? And how does that invalidate this model's understanding of emissivity? So many questions, yet so little time. Now, given the only argument I've addressed so far is that one web page that you two are scrolling over, so I'd be interested in hearing your other claims that perhaps answer these questions okay. so now what do you think now what do you think so figure b is now a direct translation of figure a so now what do you think of figure b and figure a what do you think is that real physics no is that good math not according to well there's a lot of people in the chat that believe in flat earth i have to tell you so well, screw, <laughs> screw, screw them well at least we agree on one thing screw the flat earthers so anyway for the rest of the video he talks a bit more about the greenhouse effect and explains why it couldn't possibly be correct because actual greenhouses don't heat up past the heating potential of sunlight which he marked as negative 18 degrees if that sounds outrageous to you that's because it is but since we're out of time today i won't be going over that point specifically in this video at least Maybe there'll be a part two. Maybe. Depends on if you guys behave. Thanks again to all my patrons for the support, and I'll see you next week.